Hi everyone, it's Mrs. Wallace. I uh, hope all is well. I just wanted to give you a little bit of an introduction to the Ming Dynasty. Uh, this is especially useful if you um, either miss class or if you um, wanted to just go back to some of the things that we talked about related uh, to the Ming Dynasty while we were on uh, Zoom. This is um, kind of when we look at the naval expeditions that occur in the Ming Dynasty. You know, the uh, naval expeditions occur fairly early on uh, in the Ming Dynasty. Uh, rule. It is really with the third emperor that we see the naval expeditions. So part of what we want to do in uh, this, you know, brief kind of teaching module is just to give you a sense of um, how the uh, Ming dynasty comes to be and how it really is a rejection in a sense of everything um, that the Yuan dynasty was. So if you attach the Yuan dynasty to the Mongols, and remember we did a debate in class about how much the Mongols really were taking away uh, the culture of of uh, the Chinese. You know, there is one solid argument that suggests quite a few groups of people uh, were affected by Mongol rule, even though some in China might have benefited uh, to a great degree. Scholar bureaucrats kind of get demoted. They have less political power. Uh, the Southern Song uh, Han uh, ethnicity group, you know, largely, which is the majority of the population, that uh, group of people will be kind of discriminated against and experience uh, different laws. Uh, there's also a replacement of political power with the Semu Ren, you know, outsiders who all of a sudden are kind of um, en masse in China. So there's a great deal of change up, you know, that makes a lot of people unhappy, okay? And in the end of the Yuan dynasty, so the end of the Mongol reign, uh, Kublai Khan is no longer alive and there's a series of emperors that follow him and a lot of these emperors are very weak. So toward the end of the Yuan dynasty, we see uh, a great deal of strife uh, politically because the central government is really incapable of dealing uh, with some of the issues that pop up. In addition to that, there's a lot of infighting. So even when the central government and the emperors start to become challenged, uh, there's a rise up of some of the Confucian scholars. Even before the end of the Mongols, uh, the Confucian scholars will start to reestablish their power. But the way in which uh, they go about this is essentially by, you know, fighting with each other. So there's a great deal of um, kind of factions within the bureaucrat group, and it creates a great deal of uh, strife rather than uh, unity. And so there's like a lack of um, agreement over how to, you know, kind of move uh, the society forward. In addition to that, there are some crises that occur that are really significant, one of which is a massive uh, plague. The same plague that hits Europe, that's kind of like the Black Death, uh, also hits uh, China and hits China first, and it has a lot of devastation. Not only do people die of the plague in very large numbers and in certain kind of geographical spots uh, in China, there's also a great deal of productivity stop. And at the time, you know, people are growing food. And so when the productivity stops, uh, as a result, there's also famine. A lot of the infrastructure in the society doesn't get any attention. So there's flooding and irrigation issues and lots and lots of um, problems. So um, the groups of people who become most affected by the uh, lack of government um, kind of uh, coordination uh, is the group of people uh, that are the peasants. And so the peasants um, are really seeking, you know, just kind of basic uh, necessities. And the only, uh, you know, element of uh, Chinese society at this point that's enabled to give out some, you know, basic uh, needs uh, would, would be the Bu Buddhist monasteries. So the Buddhist monasteries become places where peasants kind of congregate and, um, you know, build essentially uh, little groups that are going to uh, become, you know, peasant uh, revolting groups. Um, one such group is a group known as the Red Turbans. And uh, the individual that we see over here on the right is the first um, Ming emperor. So this is the uh, individual who really starts the Ming dynasty. Um, he cuts his teeth first by being a leading um, person within the red turban. So he has a uh, peasant background. It's very unusual in Chinese emperor, you know, history to have actually somebody who's coming from the peasant class. Uh, but he rises up and becomes um, a leader in a lot of ways in a military sense. He is going to uh, march on the Mongols and ultimately be part of the, 
you know, kind of fight to remove the Mongols from power. And the Ming Dynasty in 1368 does essentially um, establish its power. And there's not really one epic battle that does this, but kind of a series and series of things, you know, in multiple uh, fights, even after uh, 1368. Um, some of the Mongols do stay in China and do assimilate, you know, but the political power, you know, evaporates, okay? Um, and Zhu, uh, Zhu Enzang, this is the individual here, Zhu, Zhu Enzang, who, that is his birth name. His uh, reign name is Hong Wu, the Hong Wu Emperor, uh, or the Emperor Hong Wu, and he uh, becomes uh, the first emperor in uh, Ming uh, history. And Ming, the name of the dynasty, is not a family name. It's not the Ming family. It is um, the word brilliant. Okay, so it's kind of like sun, sun and moon, um, parts of uh, the Chinese characters. Okay, uh, just to give you a sense of uh, where the Ming dynasty really had its territorial reign. Uh, uh, it is much smaller than what we would say is like modern day China. Modern day China is much larger, uh, but we see this kind of uh, section up here in the north. There are parts, you know, way north of Beijing that ultimately get added to uh, China's uh, territory at this time. Um, we also see the Ming Dynasty uh, begin to uh, go into Vietnam. So there are territorial gains, uh, but much more so maybe in the next dynasty, which would be the Qin Dynasty. Uh, but you can see the Great Wall here, and that shouldn't be a surprise. This is a time period where the Great Wall will get a lot of extra attention. It's not built in this time period, but it's added to um, because there's always this threat, you know, of the nomadic peoples of the North, right? That threat is going to be continual and will define a great deal of the behavior, you know, of the empire of the Ming, okay? Um, there are a whole bunch of unsurprising things that we can kind of uh, consider. If you remember back to the class debate, you know, where we looked at the role of the Mongols in um, kind of taking taking away Chinese culture, uh, we're aware that um, scholar bureaucrats had a lot less power. Um, in some cases, the Mongols were picking and choosing, you know, what art and things like that would be kind of, uh, you know, funded. So there's a great deal of control that's non-Chinese control during the Yuan Dynasty when the dynastic power switches uh, through the Mandate of Heaven to the Ming Dynasty, there's going to be a very um, kind of uh, Chinese-centric uh, type of approach and an effort to kind of erase some of the Mongol uh, influence. So we're seeing a maintenance of lots of traditional Chinese dress, uh, Chinese dress and Chinese names. Um, anything that's Mongol dress is looked down upon. Um, there is a very large establishment of the Confucian education system. So this is going to mean the civil service exams are going to be kind of back again. The Hongwu emperor is not really going to put back the civil exams immediately. He is a little worried about the scholar class. Remember, he's a peasant so he is like a constant kind of threatened you know feeling like he is threatened um, a little uh, less secure as a leader uh, and he his tactic is really to purge enemies there is a time period in 1380 where he purges essentially thousands of people that he feels may not be loyal to him so um, the Ming dynasty does start out with a leader that has um, kind of this uh, power uh, accelerating and some of that's happening through fear but there's also a lot of attention made to the institution um, there's a very large imperial uh, bureaucracy. So lots and lots and lots of people who are going to be essentially working for the emperor. And as this develops, we see um, the mandarins. These are kind of the scholars. Uh, they will essentially, uh, you know, meet <laughs> with the emperor on a given morning. And many of them are sent around to the society. So the emperor is kind of delegating some of his power uh, to the scholar class who then are going to take it to all the different uh, provinces, you know, in China. So there's a great kind of central uh, top down way that uh, laws and rules will be taking place. And there is, by the end of the um, Hongwu Emperor's uh, reign, uh, an uh, reliance on eunuchs who are not new to uh, the court at this time, the emperor's court. Eunuchs are castrated men, uh, many of whom have been uh, intentionally castrated as young boys, maybe because they were prisoners of war or they were enslaved. Uh, some men do choose to become eunuchs, so they have access to kind of being in the emperor's palace, and maybe that's a greater sense of power. Some eunuchs actually do achieve a great deal of political power, um, but you know, they're useful because uh, the emperor is kind of surrounded by, um, you know, family and also uh, additional women um, who could bear him an heir. And so there's a lot of concern over if there is uh, a child who is an heir to the throne, 
you know, who uh, would be the father of that heir. If uh, the eunuchs or the men kind of helping uh, the uh, emperor are castrated, they cannot bear children. And so there's a lot of uh, reasons why eunuchs become increasingly popular. By the third or fourth emperor of the Ming dynasty, we see, you know, something to the extent of like 17,000, you know, eunuchs serving uh, the emperor in the Forbidden City. Uh, there's also um, a centralized structure, this kind of uh, institutional structure that surrounds the emperor uh, will last, you know, until 1911, right, to the end of dynastic rule. Um, the Yongle Emperor is probably the most significant emperor in early Ming history. The Ming uh, dynasty will last for hundreds of years, so we won't get a chance to look at every single uh, emperor's reign. But uh, the Emperor Zhu Di, that is his birth name, he is uh, the son of the Emperor Hung Wu. And um, when uh, the Hung Wu Emperor dies in 1398, um, he is actually putting, he puts his grandson in charge, okay? So the next, um, his eldest son would have been the person who would kind of take the uh, reign from him, but is the eldest son uh, is no longer alive when the Hongwu Emperor uh, dies. So uh, there's a kind of like a family uh, battle over who is going to become the next emperor. And the grandson is appointed, uh, but some of the sons uh, don't take kindly to that. And Zhu Di, who has been kind of relegated to the area of Beijing, it's kind of like where he has his childhood and whatnot, he takes over uh, by usurping power. So he kind of kills his nephew and rises to power and has issues uh, consistently of legitimacy. But he does um, become someone who is a strong leader and really does create a lot of programs uh, for the society and kind of builds up his legitimacy. But because he usurped power, you know, it's like part of his MO to kind of consistently gain the support of the public. He does a couple of big things. So he's ambitious, okay? So one thing he does is he moves the capital from the uh, northern capital, which is Nanjing, I'm sorry, southern capital is Nanjing, uh, to Beijing, which is the northern capital. And Be Beijing is like his stomping ground. It also is the former Mongol uh, capital, so it's very symbolic. Um, and he will build uh, essentially an imperial city, that inside the imperial city is the forbidden city. And so this is kind of like the city of Beijing, then inside that the imperial city, then inside that the forbidden city. The layout of this is almost kind of like a, you know, um, you know, a, you know, uh, you know, rectangle upon rectangle upon rectangle. These are all walled uh, cities. Um, and the uh, forbidden city is really designed for the emperor's use um, and for the people who will serve the emperor. And it's kind of, uh, you know, it's called the forbidden Forbidden City because it is, you know, out of uh, reach for the common public. Even the Confucian scholars uh, have places, you know, within the um, imperial city that they can go and places like the Forbidden City where they cannot go. So there's a great deal of attention to Chinese cosmology in the building of the city. And there's a couple of sources uh, that detail that. There's also the Grand Secretariat. This becomes like a political organization of sorts. They had been um, maybe a much smaller power in terms of being a group that, um, you know, created some of the paper, you know, laws of the society. A lot of what um, Judy is doing is really kind of a creating a little bit more of a balance of the different faction uh, groups. And he organizes himself to use eunuchs very heavily. So the uh, power of the eunuchs increase under him. Uh, but he also heavily re refers to the uh, Chinese Confucian scholars. And sometimes those groups are at odds uh, with each other. Um, there are also lots and lots Lots of uh, infrastructure projects. So the um, Yangla Emperor or Zhu Di, his birth name, will rebuild uh, irrigation systems. There's a great deal of state attention to uh, manufacture. So products like porcelain and silk are given a great deal of uh, state, um, you know, kind of a state investment as well as state control. Um, there is like a promotion of those types of activities, which is kind of unusual. We don't see that later in the Ming period that has a short kind of temporary uh, span to it, but a great deal of economic activity. Um, some of this becomes something that pays off in the long run. Um, a lot of people will look at the Ming Dynasty as economically very prosperous. Um, we also know the Yangle Emperor will kind of create a collection of texts that speak to the way in which um, China's culture can be maintained. So he kind of almost puts into, you know, a book form of uh, what it is that is really descriptive 
and maybe the most uh, important of Chinese uh, culture. And a lot of this is, you know, historical uh, Confucian texts, as well as things that are contemporary to the Ming period. And uh, one of the video clips and the questions was kind of noted to that. Okay, I know I'm going to run out of time. This is uh, the Forbidden City. And um, just the uh, kind of connection to the um, naval expeditions, the Yangla emperor is looking for something ambitious to enable him to suggest a greater regional power. And we